Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this topic and uh, I will uh, go right into it. Um, so what I will present today is uh, essentially my postdoc project uh, intelligence through reasoning and uh, and uh, this postdoc project is carried out uh, with uh, with my advisors, uh, with, uh, with, uh, which is uh, Robert Johansson from uh, Stockholm University, Department of Psychology. Um, there's a lot of synergy with what he is doing, with what I'm doing. Uh, he is especially uh, studying relational frame theory in order to evaluate higher level cognitive function. And uh, this is also even though this relational frame theory is uh, usually uh, usually um, um, how to say tested on humans and animals, but uh, it's it's also becoming more and more relevant for AI systems. And uh, also he, he has a lot of psychological insights to share, which which inspired me also in uh, during during my PhD at Temple University. Um, where we already collaborated on on some uh, some cognitive experiments, um, which were carried out with a reasoning system I, I will introduce in this talk. And uh, additionally, I'm, I'm uh, collaborating with my postdoc advisor Pavel Herman, who is a, who is a essentially computational neuroscientist, and tries to tries to uh, build. Uh, models which can uh, models of brain structures which can uh, run on on computer hardware and uh, so it's, so he tries to implement them uh, and, and and there's a, a lot of synergy uh, with him as well uh, because uh, different brain structures which are responsible for different cognitive uh, functions like uh, memory organization and executive function and attention in the brain is, is something which is also very relevant in the reasoning system uh, I have uh, or I'm developing, as you will see. And uh, he is also uh, uh, having, uh, he also did a lot of research on sequence memory and how, how we can even remember temporal sequences. And there are, there are a lot of parallels uh, in what he did with, with what I'm doing. And so th there's a lot of synergy here. Uh, additionally, there, there are other uh, research collaborators, which I also want to mention briefly because they, they have influenced me uh, a lot in what I'm doing and uh, in a very good way. <laughs> um, for instance, Tony Lofthouse, uh, if, uh, uh, who has the company Reasoning Systems Limited in the United Kingdom. Um, he has a... Uh, uh, collaborated with me to de develop the reasoning system, we will see, and uh, has solved many of the fundamental uh, challenges in, in making this system effective, and has worked together with me on that. Additionally, of course, Bei Wang, my, my prior uh, PhD advisor at Temple Univers University, United States, is also still uh, has influ influenced me a lot since the system I develop is really following his theory about intelligence, as we will see. Additionally, uh, I collaborate with Christian Dorison uh, at, and his team at Reykjavik University and Icelandic Institute of Intelligent Machines. Um, they are especially interested in autonomy and how to make autonomous machines. And we will also see how this relates. And additionally, uh, Antonio Cello, Valerio Saitita, oops, there's a typo in here, I apologize. Let's correct this right away. Uh, Francesco Lanza, uh, and Francesco Lanza at Palermo University, with them I have carried out some robotics uh, experiments, which were also very relevant to my PhD thesis. And I'm also collaborating with Cisco systems uh, to, who see uh, value in, in this reasoning system. And we are, there are certain projects, uh, one, of, one of which I will show, related to Smart City. And it's, it's a very interesting project. 
the, the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, I will talk briefly about reasoning, uh, its motivation, why we need reasoning, um, then adaptation and intelligence and how it relates to reasoning. <clears throat> Additionally, excuse me, <clears throat> I will talk about this non-axiomatic reasoning system, which, which I follow, which is a real-time learning reasoning system. Um, and I will only briefly talk about uh, experiments which I carried out in my PhD, uh, for my PhD thesis related to reinforcement learning using this system, and uh, also previous projects uh, then and, and the future, essentially what are new desired capabilities we wanted to have and new projects involving owner. So this is a lot to cover, so <laughs> let's start. So reasoning, adaptation, and intelligence. Uh, why, why, why do we even want reasoning? The reason is that, or at least the way I see it, is that uh, humans' ability to reason has evolved for very good reasons. It allows us to adapt to difficult and changing situations in a very uh, quick and effective way way more, uh, way better than any current AI model allows for. Um, also for animals, it's not only something which is relevant for humans, but also in animal king kingdom, uh, animals are, are able to outsmart other species. And, and in this way, they can, they can gain key survival advantages over other species. Um, and as I found during my journey in research, uh, I found that non-axiomatic reasoning can explain most of these cognitive abilities and also provides a roadmap for cognitive enhancements. There are also collaboration with uh, psychologists and, uh, and cognitive scientists and neuroscientists uh, can be very fruitful. Um, uh, additionally, I'm also, uh, I'm also uh, very interested in the practical side of this, uh, where I see this technology especially relevant to push the autonomy of robots beyond what, what, what the current state of the art allows for. Um, here, uh, here uh, I also try to utilize uh, state of the art deep learning models uh, as much as possible, wherever it makes sense to, to, to utilize them, like for perception and signal processing. Um, and uh, I hope that this, uh, that this work uh, in the end will, will, uh, will be useful for different applications where autonomous robots can make a difference, like uh, inspection and maintenance operations of, of various city infrastructure and power plants, potential cleaning operations, which are interesting from an environmental perspective and so on. And uh, I think this will lead to a new technology which will be relevant to society at some point. Um, um, but at first, some philosophical aspects. Uh, this project, uh, research project I'm carrying, I'm carrying out is essentially uh, um, following a specific definition or view on intelligence, which is that, that the essence of intelligence is the ability to adapt with insufficient knowledge and resources. So under this perspective, any pre-programmed or pre-trained system or evolved system is not intelligent when it cannot learn during its, opera during its operating time. And uh, because uh, essentially this view on intelligence puts uh, adaptation uh, at, as, a, as a key aspect, which is especially needed in, in nature to allow species to adapt to changing environments. And in reasoning systems, this can be realized via inductive inference. Traditional reasoning systems do not have this capability of inductive uh, inference. Uh, the, the, the expert systems, which, which are quite commonly known, for instance, only utilize deductive inference and so this is, in my opinion, one of the key reasons why reasoning systems did not uh, deliver on what they promised, promised a few decades ago, but it's something which can be fixed and I can show you how. Um, additionally, uh, um, also this definition of intelligence uh, puts, the, puts certain constraints on the adaptation. 
it's not it's not intelligent if uh, if the, if training if there is a an unlimited resource available in the training period like like new data samples can be generated infinitely or there are giant data sets and which can be which can be trained as long as you want in order to reach high accuracy this is not what it's about it's really about adaptation under certain constraints like insufficient knowledge and resources um, which is especially interested uh, especially important in in nature where an animal cannot uh, explore random, randomly, for instance, uh, most uh, or any fatal action will be lead to the termination or the, the death of the individual, and they have to be very careful, uh, very careful in um, what exploration uh, actions they take, and also. Also, the mental resources, especially in nature, uh, the, the brains are very energy efficient, and and the resources to to think are not unlimited, and time limits apply, and and so so, so this is all part of this definition of intelligence, that intelligence that it should work under insufficient knowledge and resources. <clears throat> if we look at the ladder of intelligence. Uh, this this uh, draws a quite clear picture, at least at least to me. Not everyone would probably agree that self-driving cars are below the intelligence level of insects. But I think after my talk, you will be convinced about that. Um, which is also related to this uh, definition of intelligence, because the way we build self-driving cars is we train models beforehand. We pre-program certain behaviors in as well. And then, and and then, uh, essentially, after it's deployed, it's not supposed to learn at this point. So it's essentially supposed to drive correctly once it's delivered. And so, uh, one level down from there is, of course, the coffee machine, which is clearly completely pre-programmed. And but one level above is already insects, and I will show you one example at least where insects are able to adapt. Uh, considerable and very interesting way um, from a from a higher level intelligence perspective i think it's clear clearer if, or it's pretty clear that certain mammals at least uh, and birds have certain reasoning abilities and humans even go one step further with uh, with language abilities which are nowhere to be found to a similar degree as as with us so this is kind of the, uh, quite a natural ladder of intelligence, which I hope we can advance. I hope we can move up from current state of the art to something like insect or mammal level at some point. But uh, the key question here is how do we even observe intelligence? How do we even know a system is intelligence? Uh, is intelligent and according to this definition of Pai Wang it's it's something which shows when you put the system in conditions which are different than the conditions the system has been designed for essentially you put the system under condition it has it has it's it's not evolved for but well, it was not even even a task which was considered when the system was designed and interestingly, even some insects, like here we see a bumblebee, a bumblebee learning from observation, it gets reward when when we, here's like a mock-up bumblebee who puts a ball into the target and and then the, the bumblebee gets reward, gets some honey. And it doesn't take long for the bumblebee to, to get this and to really understand that it has to put this ball in, into the target position. This is something insects can do, which, well, insects are largely considered to be quite stupid. They essentially can learn new tasks, which are very different than what the insect has evolved for, which is quite interesting. And uh, some of you might know Alex the Barrett, who even even can learn some simple, or even learn some simple English in order to answer questions like, how many green blocks are on this tray? And so this this parrot is able to not only 
not only count objects, which also also insects are known to, to be able to do some degree, but it's also able to, to, to learn, or it was also able to learn the meaning of the of the of the question, like how many green blocks, what, what does this question mean? How to answer it? And he, he can also the, the spirit was also able to answer different questions about what material are, are objects made of, which object is is larger than the other, and so on. So it's quite impressive what this what what some what systems in nature, so to speak, or animals are able to to show in terms of intelligence when you put them under different conditions than they have been or than they have evolved for. And the similar thing can also be done for artificial systems, like a self-driving car would certainly, even if we would would use a, a large rubber bar, it would never be able to learn this because the current technology does not include real-time learning at operating them. Um, also, from an intelligence measure perspective, uh, the progress is, is not only about end performance of, of, a, of a system like it's usually carried out in machine learning, but the key aspect are the resources. How, what is the learning speed? How many samples does the system need in order to get us up to a certain performance in a certain task? And also a key here is, is like, uh, is a system able to, uh, to, to to systematically use prior acquired knowledge in a new task so that it can learn the new task faster. And there, if there's some work in transfer learning, but this is still a very, uh, still, a, still an issue which is only very badly solved, uh, only to a very low degree. Uh, more advanced forms of intelligence of intelligent systems in nature can learn from observations as well, like the bumblebee we have just seen. Um, and also they do not just learn a state action mapping <clears throat> like it's often used in reinforcement learning. Instead, they learn the consequences of the action, actions in different circumstances. They learn essentially a causal model of, of, of the environment. They learn what they can do in the environment, how they can affect the environment in different circumstances, and use their knowledge in order to use this knowledge to reach different goals. And even higher up is theory of mind, <clears throat> but this is not part of this talk, but this is even more advanced, where uh, agent essentially models the motivations and actions of other agents, for instance. Um, and uh, but personally, I have adopted this ladder of intelligence or pyramid we have seen as a quite natural way to measure intelligence, uh, essentially by putting our AI systems uh, uh, into similar scenarios uh, as animals and humans, essentially giving them increasingly more difficult tasks to carry out, which uh, which show certain cognitive uh, cognitive abilities, or demand certain cognitive abilities to be to be solved. Um, so now I will go to a very to, to a specific system, which which I mentioned. This is this reasoning system, which can carry out or has the cognitive abilities, or some of them, which are required for this. Um, so this non-axiomatic reasoning system is also proposed by, by Dr. Wang, and it's a, it's, a, it's a general purpose reasoning system which operates under the assumption of insufficient knowledge and resources. So it's in line with the definition of intelligence uh, I, have, I have shown you earlier. So it's, what this means is also it's finite in its processing demands and storage capacity. It means it's open to new information at random. It cannot be stuck in a reasoning loop. It has to stay responsive to changing circumstances, uh, essentially to new observations it makes. So this poses very different design constraints on this reasoning system as it cannot have a like a like a search algorithm which which does not necessarily dominate when or early enough when new relevant information. Uh, becomes available. So it's essentially we want to have a real-time reasoning system. Um, 
And this non-axiomatic reasoning system uses non-axiomatic logic, which is a term logic which can deal with uncertainty. Um, I will briefly go some of the representations which can be can be represented and also to some degree learned by this by this reasoning system. For instance, uh, for instance, statements in the in this logic. Uh, this reasoning system uses uh, can be inheritance statement, can be like special case general case relationship, essentially like that cat is, that cats are animals, that Garfield is an animal, that cats have the property to, to meow and so on. And additionally implication statements, which are uh, for this talk, we will only consider temporal ones, which are essentially used to build causal models of the environment so to learn that uh, lightning observation of lightning leads to thunder or uh, even of course this can all uh, in this term logic it can also be nested like we can say if the switch has the property to be on then next the light will also go on um what's very very interesting about this uh, logic is that it does not have a boolean truth value it's not it's not that statements are either true or false instead they have a positive and negative evidence value attached to them and uh, from this several measures can be derived like this frequency measure which is almost like probability the difference is that it does not use the limit case because there can never be infinite amount of of evidence so the true limit case cannot be known. So, so this is not using the limit, but simply the ratio positive over the evidence over the total and the confidence is simply the total evidence mapped to a value between zero and one. But good about this measures is that this allows the reasoning system to distinguish cases like uh, like it can judge whether coin is fair and will be able to distinguish the case where we had 10 coin flips and got five heads from the case where we had 100 coin flips and got 50 heads. In both cases, the, the frequency, empirical frequency is the same essentially, but the 0 0.5, but the confidence will be higher in the, in the second case because the coin has been flipped. 90 times more often than in the first case. And a, 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 core, of, a core here is, uh, or at least for, for this model is, is to learn temporal relationships effectively. Like uh, if we have event sequence ABC, it would be good for it to learn the temporal relationships between the stimuli. For instance, to find positive evidence that A leads to B, to find positive evidence that A and B together leads to C, and positive evidence that A leads to C. This, when this sequence arrives for the first time, it's not clear which hypothesis is true. There is no such thing, but there's a competing hypothesis which continue to, to receive positive and negative evidence. They receive negative evidence when their precondition is fulfilled, essentially when A happens, but B does not then A leads to B receives negative evidence since it predicted B, but differently than it predicted, B did not materialize, it was not observed. So this hypothesis gets negative evidence. So we can then say that the frequency can be seen as the success of the temporal implication to predict the outcome and confidence simply encodes the amount of samples seen so far. So this reasoning system allows different hypotheses to coexist and to receive different amount of evidence. Um, and for, for my PhD thesis, uh, I actually developed a specific uh, design, implementation design, and also programmed it in C, um, which is open now for applications. Um, it's a very pragmatic design where I try to make it as effective as possible. Um, and uh, and to make sure that, it's, that it works well for cumulative real-time learning experiments and also, and also in the end that some robotic control experiments which can be used <clears throat> to reach higher autonomy in robots. Um, also, it has, it has a way to, to interface with deep learning models like object detection models and also simultaneous localization and mapping uh, 
uh, uh, algorithms which are heavily used in robotics so that the robot builds a map of its environment and and can localize itself in the environment so core capabilities here are the system should learn from event streams in real time without interruption it should extract sensory motor contingencies and this is interesting Con sensory motor contingency is essentially nothing else than such a temporal implication just with the difference that the last element in the sequence of its precondition is an operation so essentially a sensory model contingency represents that under a certain context a certain operation will lead to a certain consequence and it should use this sensory model contingencies in order to plan ahead to reach course uh, to, to reach its own course essentially and and because this the, uh, this can be used to build uh, autonomous agents and robots um the architecture i will only go briefly through it uh, um it's essentially it's essentially a, a, a quite generic approach where different sensory channels are present which which can be very specific to the modality uh, it's essentially a way to receive information like uh, that this is where you plug in object detection models and and like for vision into the system and this and this uh, sensory each sensory channel is supposed to to map this this uh, signals which are obtained from physical signals into nasi statements as we have seen before um so this can be something like there's a cat to the left or there's a cat at a certain coordinate um can be encoded as a nasi statement which is an event which becomes an event in this system um and the next step is then to take the events which come from the different modalities like sound vision and so on and to sequence them essentially to put them into the into a sequence of the order they appear in and from there they are sent into the, the global attention buff of the system and uh, since the system is a reasoning system it has to have some reasoning loop and this is not this is the reasoning loop it takes out some some event from this uh, attention buffer selects a relevant second premise from concept memory essentially <clears throat> this one is storing uh, is essentially the long-term memory of the system so it's picking some information which is relevant to the event which just occurred and then it's deriving new information from it and dependent on whether this is a uh, whether both premises uh, the event and the one we, the, the belief we picked from memory whether they share a common a term a common pattern so to speak then it's a case of semantic inference but if the relationship is temporal then it falls under sensory motor inference um so semantic inference is essentially dealing with declarative <clears throat> knowledge so to speak like if we know that Garfield is a cat and cats are animals, then we can derive that Garfield is an animal where deduction, but there is also inductive and abductive uh, um, reasoning in the system. And the temporal reasoning we have seen before um, is, a, is also a case of this inductive reasoning where essentially when we have two events and <clears throat> one event happens after the other, then it's giving positive evidence that that the first event leads to the second. <clears throat> so this, this is essentially how induct, induction or a case of induction in the system. And if, if, a, if a hypothesis is formed, it can also be used forward. Like if, if, uh, if the system already has learned that A leads to B <clears throat> and A is observed, then it will predict B. But even more important, uh, sensory motor inference is to derive subcores, like uh, like the system wants to achieve a certain core G, <clears throat> but there will be many competing hypotheses. So which one to pick? And so the idea is always, okay, this hypothesis it, it needs to be some way to achieve G. So some operation the system has to core in order to get G, given current circumstances C. But but not every option is is uh, 
is equally good. Uh, so the system has to compare the evidences essentially for the for the operation by using this deduct, deductive inference and compare the uh, essentially look at the evidence which which or truth value of this operation event which essentially encodes how 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 likely or how certain is it that this operation will lead to the outcome given current circumstances and the system should pick the operation which most likely leads to g given current circumstances so this is what it does uh, this is what it does it picks the the one which has the highest evidence to lead to g but sometimes there is not a uh, sometimes there is not a single decision step possible because sometimes even the preconditions themselves need yet to be reached so the system also has this way when a way of deriving a subcore essentially if there is no such operation which can lead to g currently then derive the subcores or the pre the conditions preconditions so the, the context as a subcore in order to be realized first so then c becomes the new g and the cycle repeats so uh, this is the algorithm for it but i have already explained it on the slide um and the, the usage of the system is quite straightforward. So we, we always receive uh, statements in this non axiomatic logic, which are called events. They always have some term and some, some they can also have some certainty value attached to them, like to have to assign lower confidence to or lower positive evidence to sensor reading with readings where the sensor is known to be unreliable, for instance. Um, Yes, and the system will output either operations, which is like if we enter a core event, which is essentially also a, simply a statement, but the statement the system wants to achieve, <clears throat> then this, the system will essentially core an operation, uh, or it will, it will essentially try to achieve the core using operations. Additionally, it also has the capability to, to answer, to answer uh, to answer with the truth value of a certain relationships, for instance, we can ask the system to what, how much evidence do you have that ravens have black color, for instance, and that ducks are yellow, and so on, and what to what, how certain are you that uh, that a certain light switch activates the light, for, for instance, it's different hypotheses with different bases of evidence. Um, this project is ongoing since uh, February 2020, uh, the implementation of it. Um, so, it's, so it's all on GitHub. I will not go into this too much. This, this you can uh, see and, and this you can see on GitHub anyway. Um, <clears throat> I also, during my, my PhD thesis, I also did some comparison with reinforcement learning. For this talk, I think it's not too, not too relevant, so, so I will only briefly go through it. Essentially, I compared uh, the system on, uh, on examples which are typically, uh, which are quite uh, typical reinforcement le learning experiments. I picked Q-learning as a particular method and compared with it, and I showed that, <clears throat> that uh, this reasoning system delivers similar learning performance and I also had less parameter tuning to do because there's no such thing as learning rate decay, for instance. But for the Q learner, it was very important to get the learning rate and learning rate decay rate in order to get the similar performance. Um, yes, so, so this is uh, one thing I did for my PhD thesis, essentially. I also had read multiple uh, multiple reinforcement learning environments, also something called grid world, which is a bit closer to robotics. Essentially, it, here it has to learn to, to avoid obstacles and to collect green objects. So the red thing is the robot, and the green things are, for instance, battery cells it has to collect. <clears throat> and, in, and what was also interesting is uh, Interesting is uh, that uh, while here uh, it achieved uh, also similar performance, it was also relevant to see that the reasoning 
system does not uh, rely on Markov property. Like I had a uh, example of uh, of uh, essentially space invaders where the system needed uh, or upon it was actually where the system had to utilize a stop operation in order to, to stop left and right movement. And this violated the Markov property, which led to worse performance for the <clears throat> for the Q learner in this case. Which was also interesting to see. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a summary. Um, and here we, we also see that <clears throat> in, in the case of Pong, that the that the uh, that the success rate really was was uh, very different in in the in the non Markovian Pong with the stop operation where the Q learner struggled because the Markov property was violated, and the simplified Pong where where uh, where only had left and right operation there to performed. Similarly, um, there are, uh, we also did previous NAS and deep learning projects, uh, one together with, with Chat Proportion Laboratory, um, which was uh, building a driving assistance system, uh, actually a mission assistance system, which is supposed to one uh, to assist uh, to one first responses from, from dangers, but also to assist them during the mission. And here we here we see one example where where the system detects an incoming collision because it notices it also gives the warning for the red car. There is also a car here, but this one is not moving, and the one which does not stop at the traffic light is correctly detected by the reasoner, and the warning message message is generated. So this is one of the things you can do with the system. Uh, together with Cisco systems, we also applied it to detect different traffic anomalies, like to detect when when pedestrians are jaywalking. And here it was very important for this for the for the system to take a real-time learning approach because they they wanted to deploy this uh, or they deployed this actually in Australia, uh, Melbourne. Um, they mounted traffic cameras uh, essentially and ex expected that the, that the operator did not have to configure the scene like telling the system where the sidewalk is what is used as a road and so on instead the, the reasoning system is supposed to learn uh, which parts of the road are used as, as really a, really as a place where vehicles are driving and which places are used as a sidewalk for instance. And so based on this, it can then detect anomalies like when when a place like here where usually it's used by cars, but suddenly a pedestrian is, is there, for, for instance. Additionally, the experiments uh, in robotics uh, where I where I combined uh, reasoning ability, essentially ability to, to learn new information or new knowledge at random with some mission knowledge. And in this particular task, it was able to learn how to avoid obstacles by itself. And was also able to learn by itself how to focus on, on a particular object. Um, and then with a bit of background knowledge, which essentially only said it has to pick the, pick the bottle and has to, to, has to, uh, has to let go of it when it sees other bottles. And in combination with the learned behavior to avoid obstacles and to, to bring bottles to the center, it was able to complete this experiment. So, so it was able to, to find the bottle in the room, was able to pick it up, find the other bottles, and then to, then to drop it to the other bottles. So this was a case essentially where learned behavior is combined with with uh, with some user given knowledge, which is quite a, a strength of reasoning systems in general. But in this, uh, of course, it, in this system, it's it's special that it can also learn new knowledge at random. I cannot go into the details here because we're already running short. Short uh, of time is already short, but uh, it's important to. to 
to mention probably that in this experiment, it was really able to learn uh, several important hypotheses like that uh, if if there if there is no obstacle and the forward operation is invoked, then itself will will uh, really really uh, change its position forward. Well, well, if there's an obstacle observed and the left operation is 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 utilized, then the obstacle will not be seen anymore. So these two together lead to a behavior which makes the system essentially drive around and move move to the left whenever there's an obstacle, for instance. And also was able to, to see that, okay, when there's an object on the left side and the left operation is invoked, then the object will be in the center. This also shows some generalization because this really applies to all objects, even though in this particular experiment, it was key to use this learned knowledge to pick up bottles. Yes, and the mission knowledge is, as I mentioned, very minimal. It only says if the grip is open and there's a bottle in the center, it should pick it. And, and if there's a bottle in the center and the grip is already closed, then drop it. But the, the key thing here is how, how to get the bottle in the center. So it has to use this knowledge here. It has to know, okay, if something is on the left, then it has to turn left. And then if this obstacle appears, it also has to know how to get around of the obstacle. And it can do exactly that. And it uh, was quite robust uh, to, to, to perform this kind of task. Um, since I'm already almost out of time, I will skip the encodings here uh, for, for this project. Yes, yeah, so there are certain benefits which one can gain uh, from the system already know. Uh, already now, like there is no need for some kind of learning rate decay compared to reinforcement learning. It can, of course, since it's a reasoning system, it's easy to, or it's, it can deal, or it can utilize background knowledge effectively. Then it's, its behavior is inherently core independent. So it's not learning state action mapping for a single task. Instead, it's really learning what action will lead to which consequence under what circumstances. Um, can learn new knowledge at random, which is unusual for a reasoning system. And, it, and we have had some success in applying it to the, to the, uh, to the um, domains we saw. Uh, new capabilities uh, want to develop for the systems, uh, for the system is essentially now, uh, how to say, for this postdoc, essentially I want to push the cognitive abilities of the system, which is also why the collaboration with Robert Johansson is so important. Um, and his work on relational frame theory has heavily influenced me. Like, like there's a, there are typical experiments uh, in, like, uh, which show the importance of relational reasoning capability uh, for cognition. Like here, this identity matching experiments, which some animals are, are actually able to, to carry out, such as a sea lion um, was able to, for instance, if there, if there, if there are, uh, how to say, like there is some example in the middle and some example on the left and on the right. And here it's, the, here it's the right to pick the left one because it's same like the one in the middle. Here it's here it's the, the here it's the, to pick the right one uh, since it's the same leg in the middle. But that's actually quite difficult. Uh, uh, that's actually in this case it's simple. But what if what if only certain characteristic properties are shared with the with the element in the middle? Like the left one has the same shape but has a different color than the example in the middle. Then the right one has has a different shape but has the same color. And so we so we can experiment as a is a system able to to utilize only certain certain shared properties. Like if we give it this example, does it notice? Okay, in this case the shape is similar with the thing in the middle, even though the color is different. So this one is still a better option than this triangle here because this triangle has neither neither same color nor same shape. And similar here, better to pick this one. It at least has the same color even though it has not the same shape 
because this uh, this triangle has neither the same shape nor the same color like the thing in the middle and the animals can very effectively learn such things and also also from a problem solving uh, perspective it's interesting what relational reasoning can bring to the table in, in, in order to make a system improvise in its decision making like what if we want to unscrew a screw but we don't have a screwdriver we only have a toothbrush available <laughs> but we also have a lighter so maybe we can melt the toothbrush and and press it on the on the screw in order for it and then wait a bit for it to harden so that we can so then that essentially the the shape of the of the head of the screw is ingrained in the toothbrush so that it can then be used to unscrew the screw and there's a lot of knowledge which goes into this kind of decision making your system has to realize that toothbrush is made of plastic and that plastic is a material which can be melted when it gets hot it has to realize that lighters can generate heat and that heat uh, causes meltable materials to melt and so on and so it's very important to 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 have systems able to to do relational reasoning if we ever want to get to systems which can improvise uh, during the during the operation in order to solve problems in novel ways um here i will not go into the details and uh, I'm or, or, almost done with the presentation. Um, I only want to mention some current plans because in this postdoc project, we also try to apply for, for some extra funding. And uh, there is one EO project, which is uh, related to automated inspection and maintenance uh, in power plants. So essentially we want to have a robot which goes through a, power plant and automatically collects measures from analog, analog gauges. And the, the reason for this is that uh, power plants often, they don't, they don't have uh, digital, uh, digital uh, display devices uh, yet. So, uh, so either we could update all the power plants, which is very expensive, or one simply places a robot which can, which patrols the power plant like thrice a day and takes measurements from the analog displays. Um, for instance, this is one thing we want to do, but also for waste collection in, in cities. And also our demonstrator project will, will, will also be in this direction approximately, even though we are still working on the details here. There are also some, some robots which are very very uh, good for us for demonstration purposes. It's essentially robots which are both mobile and also have an actuator because these robots can then be used to, to manipulate the environment, which is very good for AI demonstration. Um, yes, and so we are also collaborating with, with two, uh, or at least we want to collaborate here with Cognet uh, for, for the for the inspection and maintenance tasks in, in power plants in order to, to increase the autonomy of the deployed robots. And the other thing is together with Aarhus community to, to, to utilize autonomous robots for waste collection abilities. Also, also, also in waste collection, there's a lot to, to gain from, from autonomous robots. For instance, there's a huge difference between a robot which simply drives around randomly in order to search for trash or an adaptive robot which learns where, where in the city uh, trash tends to accumulate more than in other places. And so ideally this, the robot would concentrate on places where it ha has learned that, that uh, tr trash tends to accumulate more. And for instance, so there, there are a lot, but also other other issues can appear at random, be it due to weather conditions, changing weather conditions, and so on, new obstacles, etc., which can, where it's essentially valuable if a robot has some some ways to adapt to the situation, instead of simply stopping. Uh, uh, that's essentially it, and uh, I think we can open the 
question answering, but 